It's your open source advocate and I'm back with another video and today I want to talk about Netbird. Now Netbird reached out to me a few weeks ago to ask if I'd be interested in covering their software. Um, this is another WireGuard uh, VPN option but it is open source, it is self-hosted, it is very similar in my opinion to NetMaker. Um, looks really good, I haven't tried to install it yet, I haven't tried to do anything. But one of the things that I, I did want to kind of point out which I really appreciate um, they're not paying me to sponsor this video. They're not doing anything like that, but they do have a discount code for any of you who want to try to come use their paid plans. So um, I'll talk about that later in the video so that you know what you can get by using their services. But one of the things that I appreciate about any open source project, and I've been looking at a lot of open source projects lately because I'm getting ready to do a series that I, that I just really am excited about, and I've been looking for different solutions to different problems that that series would need. And I find a lot of things that come up when I search for open source XYZ, whatever I'm looking for. I go to their pages, I check out their homepage, they've got tons of great marketing kind of spiel, things like that. They show you exactly how to get to their pricing really easy but they do not show you how to get to their open source project. So one thing I really appreciate about NetBird is it's right here. They're saying, hey, we're open source and if you click, this is gonna take you to GitHub where you can see what's going on with our software. I cannot tell you how much I appreciate that as an open source advocate, as a person who seeks out open source technology intentionally. This little thing right here makes a huge difference. And, and a lot of projects will have at least the GitHub logo or a link or something that says open source or community version, things like that. So that said, I really appreciate that NetBird has this button right here. It makes it so easy to go and look at what they're doing. How often are they updating the software? And this is the last few days is where I've seen some of the latest uh, updates that they've made, which is awesome. They're pretty new to the game, but they've really got a lot of stuff. And, and I think it's just amazing what you can get from the the project. So I'm going to jump over to their GitHub page here because it has a really nice checklist. But yeah, if you look right here, four days ago, yesterday. So you've got some really recent things that are happening on it. So they're, they're actively developing this, which is awesome. You can see they've got a nice set of contributors here, which is great. And uh, I'm going to jump way down to the bottom real quick. One of the things I appreciate is that they say, we are based on open source technologies like WireGuard, Pion Ice, this, which is WebRTC, Coturn, which I've talked about in the past, and then Rosenpass. They appreciate what those other open source projects are doing. That's awesome. Thank you for saying that. Truly, truly appreciated whenever I see anybody else appreciating somebody for an open source project. But then they also say, we'd greatly appreciate it if you could support them. Not, hey, here's a place to donate to us. We have a business model already, but if you'd like to donate something, if you appreciate the work that they're doing that's helping us do this, go donate to them. That's awesome. I appreciate them doing that and them linking to these other places. That's that's totally awesome that, that they do that and, and that they make it so easy for you to find that and, and for you to be able to go and help keep those projects going as well. So I'm going to go back up to the top here because I've got a nice checklist of things that they offer. So here's their key features. So you can see what their connectivity features are. So they use the WireGuard kernel inside of Linux at least. Now they've got uh, Windows, Mac. Android, they have a beta for iOS out now, OpenWRT, so you can see over here what all they've got already checked off. They've got an OpenWRT version, which is awesome because I'm using OpenWRT, which means I could just set my whole network to be on the WireGuard network, which is cool. Uh, they've got Docker, of course. iOS, like I said, is in beta, so it's not checked yet, but they just put out the beta, I think, yesterday uh, from the time that I'm filming this. So be aware that it's, it's going and it'll be checked off pretty soon, but you'll have pretty much any way you connect to your network or the internet to be able to connect to the NetBird network, which is awesome. Peer-to-peer um, -peer connections, peer-to-peer -peer encryption using WireGuard. It has connection relay fallback. So sometimes there are networks like your carrier grade networks that don't allow direct peer-to-peer -peer connections to your smartphones and things like that. So you do need some kind of relay fallback if that happens, which is really nice that they have that. So you can set up routes to external networks, and then you have NAT traversal if, if possible. That'll be done as well. If you jump over to the management, they've got an admin web UI, and we'll look at that as we go through here. They've got the auto peer discovery and configuration, which is really great. So they're making this very, very low touch. You just need to install NetBird and then install the NetBird agent on your different devices, and things kind of just are done in the background for you to help them discover each other. Just like when you added, when we did Headscale a few weeks ago, and you added a tail scale client, um, 
you could just show a list of all the other clients. It was really great and really cool. So this is really awesome. I like this. The IDP integrations is pretty great. I don't know exactly what they've got so far, uh, but this SSO and MFA support IDP integrations are there. So definitely like Google, you'll have different things like that that you can use for your logon instead of just using your email and password. Um, I'm hoping that they'll have where I can use like my custom authentic and set up my own IDP. That would be great. Um, access control groups and rules, private DNS, multi-user support, activity logging, and then you've got SSH access management, which is really awesome. Uh, for the automation side, they've got a public API. You can set up keys for bulk network provisioning, which is really important if you're an enterprise level person, if you're an IT person, you're looking for a solution that could help some of your clients. Maybe you're an MSP and you're looking for a really good VPN solution to help your clients and make it easy. That's a fast connection because believe me, I love OpenVPN. It is an awesome project and it has helped me through years of doing things over a VPN. But if I can use WireGuard, I have shown in past videos that on a personal setup, WireGuard is much, much faster than OpenVPN. OpenVPN cuts your connection down quite a bit, depending on how you set it up. But WireGuard definitely is just out of the box, much faster, which is great. Um, so again, self-hosting quick start script, which is great. That's what we're going to use today. They've got the IDP group sync with uh, JWT tokens. And then here's the platforms again that they support. So this is pretty much all the main ones. Now, if you happen to be a BSD user, maybe the Linux version would work for you, but I think there's definitely some different things in the networking stack for that. So I can't promise you that. But if, if they're not supporting it and you want it, then that's something you should, hey, you know, let them know like, hey, we'd love to see some BSD support and maybe you can contribute something to help them get that going. So I'm pretty excited about this one. They've got a lot of really cool stuff and, and I love to, to see how they put things together like this. But um, but I do always ask them to provide a discount code or some kind of benefit for all of you as viewers. So there will be a discount code, but I do want you to see the pricing even before the discount code happens. And I want to talk about how this is going to support the open source version. So using their hosted services for free, that's zero dollars per month, you can have up to five users and a hundred devices right off the bat, okay? That means you can get on there and try it out with a bunch of devices and five different users that you want to have access to this thing and you get the peer-to-peer -peer connections. You get SSO with Google, WordPress, Azure, GitHub. You get access controls. You get private DNS. You get the network routes and you get a management activity log so you can see what's going on for people who are actually managing this setup for you. That's This is amazing. This is a really great deal right out of the gate just to use their hosted services and not even have to go set up the server yourself. Now, we're self-hosters and I understand that, so you want to know how to do that, but I did want you to understand, like, if you just want to test this out, here's your way to do it. If you like it and you're like, man, I love this, maybe my work would be willing to put this in place, then look at this size. For Teams, you can do unlimited users. Okay, that means if you have a thousand employees, ten thousand employees, forty thousand employees, this is what they're saying now. They don't they probably don't want forty thousand employees on their network. They might need to have a little discussion with you first, but if you've got somebody that you know, twenty employees or twenty people on a team that you're doing something with, you can have a hundred devices, a hundred machines, plus ten per user. So if you had twenty people, that's two hundred extra machines. That's three hundred machines plus these users for five dollars per user per month five dollars that's a hundred dollars a month to be able to have 300 machines and unlimited user or 20 users that that's amazing now you can try it for free and then you get some extra bonuses on top of what you get with the free plan so you get the free plan plus these things that's really awesome let's just say you are a really big business maybe you've got a thousand users that you want to get set up then it's time for you to jump over to this one you get some extra stuff down here of course but then look at this it's the same thing unlimited users 100 machines plus 10 per user, 10 per user. So if you had 100 users, that's 1,100 machines at $12 per user per month. Now, if you're a business, $1,200 per month might be a pretty smart investment for some encrypted secure networking. That's really cool. So I like the pricing. I, I like that the way that they're kind of starting to work on this. And we're about to check out the software and see how it functions. So again, I'm going to set up a network on a VPS with DigitalOcean and then we're going to get everything installed and we'll go install a couple of clients and see how well they communicate and we'll look at the user interface and see what all we can do. To get started we're going to go over and we need to have a couple of things in place in order to run this at least out on a VPS but really even in your own 
firewall or inside of your own network. So you're going to need a domain name again. That could be a, like a dynamic domain name like DuckDNS or something like that. Or it could be one that you own, which is perfectly fine. Um, and you're going to need something to run it on. So if you're running on your home server, go ahead and set up your VM. Get everything ready. Get those ports forwarded that we talked about earlier. But I'm going to do this on, uh, on DigitalOcean because it's pretty easy. So I've got DigitalOcean here. You've got this whole side panel of control and things you can do. But really, you just go up here, click on Create, Droplet. That's what they call their virtual private servers. I'm in the United States, and I am pretty much right in between New York and San Francisco. So these doesn't really matter which one I pick, but they've got different data centers that you can pick from. Um, this is just the one they auto-picked for me. It's fine. As we go down, I'm going to use the Ubuntu uh, version just because I'm, I'm very accustomed to that. I do want to use an LTS. I prefer to do that for things that are going to be long-term type setups. So I'm going to use the 2204 version. That's a 64-bit. We're going to go down and uh, the size here. So they kind of start you off with basic, but you can jump between these things and see how the prices change depending on what you're trying to get. So they've got a lot of options. Some of them are more expensive. Some of them aren't that expensive. But if you stay down here at the basic, you can get a lot out of it for kind of these self-hosting type uh, situations. So right here, they've got a set on what it says, a uh, premium AMD. So that's going to be our premium AMD. If you go to premium Intel, the price changes by a dollar. So just kind of notice as you change what the price does. And then they've just got regular. So I'm going to use regular. I don't have to have anything super great. And if you'll notice, there is a little bit more over here on regular. So there's a $4 one. Now this is going to give you 512 megabytes um, with one CPU. That's, that's RAM. Now they said two gigs of RAM is what they suggest. So that's going to take us over to here, which is about the $12 mark, which is fine. It could work here on the, on the one CPU, you know, one gig of RAM, but they suggest this one. So that's what I'm going to go with to try to be successful. You can always play with it and see what you can get. Like I said, I'm an affiliate. So if you use my link, you will get a credit for DigitalOcean that you can try before you have to buy anything. And if you cancel and don't ever pay, I don't get anything. I just like DigitalOcean. I think their setup's really easy. If you like Linode, if you like Volter, they're all pretty similar, to be honest. But yeah, I mean, DigitalOcean is just where I'm at and what I'm used to. I do recommend, if you're setting this up, go create an SSH key. Put it in here. So I'm going to use this one, and I'm going to use my iMac so that I can access this from either machine. These are my public keys that pop up, so don't worry about that you're seeing it. It's fine. We're going to go on down. We're going to go on down. Now, there's a, little, there's a few other options here, but none of these things that we need right now. But down here, I'm going to go ahead and name this droplet. You can name it anything you want. You see, they just give you a random name. I'm going to go ahead and name this the way that I want it to be called. So I'm just going to name this netbird.opensourceisawesome.com. So I own the domain, opensourceisawesome.com, and I can set up the A records to point to the IP address that they're going to generate for me here in a minute. If you have a lot of DigitalOcean droplets, if you're really using them to the fullest, tags can really help you sort and find things pretty quickly. So it, it helps to tag things, but I've only got a few, so I don't need that. So I'm going to click on Create. It's going to start creating that droplet. I'm going to jump over here, and I'll show you kind of what we're working with uh, in, in here with uh, Cloudflare. So uh, this is the only domain that I have in Cloudflare. I, I, I don't really use most of the services that they offer. Um, just be aware they have some pretty cool stuff that you can see. But let's see, I'm going to go to DNS. Oh, actually, we're going to go over here to add a record, sorry. And it's already set to A, which is great. And we're going to need the name. So that was NetBird. And you see right here, it fills it out. NetBird at opensourceisawesome.com is what it's going to be called. We're going to need that IP address that we get from DigitalOcean. And then we have to decide if we want this to be proxied or not. In this case, because it's doing some kind of stuff with, with our network, we, we don't want it to be proxied. Um, so just be aware of that. Um, and then your time to live is auto, but we can set this to whatever we want. So I'm going to set it to five minutes because we'll have plenty of time to work on other stuff while we're waiting for this to kind of get set. In fact, we could probably even do 10 minutes and then be a little kind. But there we go. So we've got 10 minutes set up. We just need to grab that IP address from DigitalOcean when it's finished. So it's about to finish up here. And we're just going to copy. Just click on a little copy button. We're going to go back here and we're just going to paste that into the IP address field. And we've got an A record set up. And now all we have to do is save that. And that's it. It's added. So we've got NetBird, and it's going to point to our public IP address for our DigitalOcean uh, droplet. So the next thing we need to do is actually access that droplet through an IP address uh, or through the, the domain name if you've had it set up for long enough. And we're just going to go here, and we're just going to do, uh, let's see. I'm going to make this a little larger for you guys. So we're going to do SSH, and I'm going to do root because it sets up the root user for you automatically. And I'm just going to paste in that uh, IP address. It's going to ask if I trust it, which I'm trying to go to it, so I do. And it's going to log me in. So we're going to clear this out. And first thing I'm going to do is just update it. So apt update, two ampersands, apt upgrade, 
dash y. We're going to let this thing update, and once it's up to date, we're going to create a non-root user that has pseudo privileges to use for the rest of this tutorial. All right, that completed, so I'm just rebooting that server real quick. So I just typed in reboot. I didn't have to type sudo because I was logged in as root anyways, but we're going to let that reboot. It takes about 15, 20 seconds. They're really fast to reboot, which is great. And then we'll log right back into it. So I'm going to clear that out, and I'll just do SSH again. Uh, we'll go ahead. Let's see if it's back up. Not yet. It's not back up yet. We're just going to give it a little more time. If you ever get connection refused, it could just mean that it's still rebooting. Don't don't freak out about that. Just kind of give it a few minutes or a little bit of you know a little bit of time, and then try again. There we go. See now it's talking. That's great. It's going to log us in. Awesome. And we're going to go back up here to just clear this out. And what I want to do is I want to create a non root user who has pseudo privileges. So we can do that pretty easily with a few commands. So add user. This is a Debian slash Ubuntu command. I don't think this is in Fedora. If you're on Fedora or a different kind of workstation, you would do user add. And then you need to go create the home directory and set up a password form and things like that. But nice thing about add user is it kind of does that for us. So I'm just going to say add user Brian. That's me. And it's going to ask me for my password. So I'm going to put in a nice, strong uh, super user password here. And then I'm going to confirm it. Hopefully I typed it correctly. Yes. Now you can fill all this out. You don't have to, but it's up to you. And then you're going to go down here and that capital Y means that's the default to accept this information. So yes. Now I've created my user, but I'm not a super user yet. So I need to make myself a super user. So I'm going to do user mod hyphen little a capital G and then we're going to say uh, pseudo and then we're going to put in the names of the users that we want to have pseudo privileges so I'm going to just it's just me so Brian so it's user mod space hyphen little a capital G space pseudo space Brian or whatever username you used of course hit enter and now your user is a super user now the last thing for me is I don't have the ability to log in yet because I'm using SSH keys and not password authentication. Now you could go change something in your Etsy uh, SSH file to allow password authentication briefly and then do SSH copy ID to push up your SSH keys and all that kind of stuff. But the SSH keys I'm going to be using are the exact same ones that I already have in my root user. So I'm just going to copy that folder over so it's a little bit quicker and a little bit easier to do. We're just going to do cp dot slash dot SSH. There we go. And I'm going to copy that to slash home slash Brian slash. So if you put that in slash like that, it's going to copy this folder over to this directory. And we need this to be dot SSH. Let's make sure we get that set correctly. And we can actually just take out the dot slash. There we go. Dot SSH to home Brian. And let's see. Oh, I got to use a dash R because it's a folder. So sorry about that. We got to have CP space dash R, which means recursive, which means everything inside of this folder. And then the folder is dot SSH. It's a hidden folder. And then we're going to copy that to slash home slash Brian. And then we have that in slash so that it copies it into my folder. There we go. That's done. Now we're just going to change the permissions on it. So we're going to do Chown dash capital R in this case for recursive Brian colon Brian that's me for my user and me for my group and we're gonna say slash home slash Brian and that'll get everything uh, under it so there we go so now I'm the owner of that SSH key file and I can exit uh, from root and I can just go back and change root to Brian and actually let's try out our uh, domain name and see if we can get in with that yet. So netbird.open source is awesome.com. And do you trust it? Yes, I do. So that means that it's routing correctly and we're logged in and I'm logged into netbird. That's cool. All right. So we're going to clear out the terminal one more time here and then we've got a little bit more setup to do. So we've done a couple of things. We've set up our domain name. We've pointed it to our public IP address. We've updated our server and we've created our non root user that has super user privileges. So we're doing really well. We've just got to kind of work through these steps a little at a time, but we're going to use the NetBird self hosting quick start guide. It says right here, five minutes and it shouldn't take too long, but there's some things that we need to read through and just make sure we get everything set up. Now they're going to, they're going to use a Zitatel IDP for your login. So it, it sets up everything for you. Um, nothing for you to do from that standpoint. But there's a couple of things that they do tell you that you want to make sure you get set up correctly. So you want that Linux VM and again, one CPU, two gigs of RAM. We've already set that up, which is great. Um, the VM should be publicly accessible. So you need certain ports and port ranges. Again, this is another reason not to have it on your local network. We talked about that earlier. And then you've got this public domain name, which you've already set up and pointed to our virtual public, uh, virtual private server, which is great. 
So Docker installed on the VM. That's going to be an important one. JQ installed on the VM and then curl installed on the VM. So we want to get those things all installed and set up on this virtual private server that we set up. Um, so we're going to go through and do those things. Once we've got all of that stuff set, we should be pretty much ready to go and we'll have a set of commands down here that we can follow uh, to make everything really pretty quick and easy and painless. In fact, they've got a simple one liner here, which we can use, which is great. So first, let's go get these other things set up and make sure that we've got this stuff installed and ready like they've asked us to. All right, I've got our virtual server set up and I've created a non root user. So I did that in the background, but you should always do that. It's very important for you to have a non root user with pseudo privileges. So that's what I've created here. Um, I've SSH into this server and we're going to go ahead and install um, curl and JQ. So we're going to do sudo apt install curl and then also JQ. We're just going to put them both in the same command and then dash Y. So it's going to go through and it's going to say, hey, we need to install a couple of things here. I already told it yes, so it's not going to prompt me. It just goes through and does the installation and install both of those things pretty quickly. So if we do curl, we should just get like, hey, try curl help. If we do JQ, it's going to give us a little bit of information about it. And here's the listing of options for JQ. So good. We've got them both installed. Uh, we can clear that out. Now we need to get Docker. Now you can do, go through and do a bunch of manual steps to get Docker. Um, the way that I like to do it is I created a script out here. This makes it a lot easier and I'll just give you a one liner to basically get this running, but I've got it out here on my GitLab. So we're just going to go down here to the one that says Docker installs and I'll give you a direct uh, link right to what you need. And I'll give you the, the one liner command. You won't even have to go do what I'm doing right now, but I'm going to go in here and I'm going to get the raw version of this. I'm just going to grab this link and I'm going to go back over here and I'm going to say wget dash and then capital O, I'm going to call this install-docker.sh. So that's what we want the file to be called, and then we're going to paste in that link. So it says wget is going to go grab what's at this link, and it's going to create it, it's going to pull it down and call it a file that's install-docker.sh. So I'm going to do that, there we go. Uh, we'll clear that out, and then if we do ls, we'll see install-docker.sh. We're going to do chmod plus x install-docker.sh, which makes this executable. And now we can run it with dot slash install docker dot sh. When we do that, it's going to come up and tell you, here's what your operating system looks like it is. It's Ubuntu, Ubuntu 22.04, and then it gives you information. That's just to help you pick from here in case you're not sure which one you've got. So this should support everything. In fact, this will support plus, so that's 23.04, 23.10. It should work on any of those. Um, Ubuntu 18.04 has got its own number, Debian 10 and 11. This should actually be 12 also. Uh, CentOS 7, 8, Stream, Fedora, just so on. Any of the Red Hat spins basically is number one. You've got Arch Linux for five. You've got OpenSUSE for six. Uh, ARM64 for Raspbian for seven. And then if you don't want to end up doing this, you can just hit eight and it'll quit, quit the installer. But we want to do number four. And this is going to ask us, do you want Docker CE? Yes. And then it says Docker Compose appears to be installed. It is, so that's good. Um, so we're just going to hit no for the rest of these. So I do have some other uh, containers that you could set up if you wanted to try those out. But this is going to go through and it's going to try to run updates on the server real quick. And as long as it doesn't hit any snag with like the VPS, I run the updates first in the background just to make sure everything's updated and then the script runs. But with the VPS, sometimes it prompts you and because I'm not showing you everything on the screen, you don't see the prompt and it'll look like it's hung. Just pass on by it if that happens. So we're getting Docker CE installed. Now, if you didn't have Docker Compose installed already, it would prompt you about Docker Compose. You would also want to hit yes for this particular project for that one as well. All right, looks like everything's good. It's going to create this Docker network. Uh, yep. All right, cool. So I just do a few things for you through that script. It's nothing that you have to worry about or use in this case, but it's, it's pretty easy to get everything installed that way instead of running a bunch of separate commands. So now if we do Docker PS, there we go. And if we do docker compose ps, same thing. So it says no configuration file provided, but that means docker compose installed. I just couldn't find a docker compose.yaml file, which is fine. All right, we're going to clear that out. We're going to go back to their instructions, their quick instructions here. And here's the single liner. So we're just going to copy this guy. And you could just use the copy button over there, but sometimes it tries to run it right then. So I'm going to do control copy or control C. I'm going to go here, control shift V. And then I'm just going to use uh, control A to jump back to the beginning because we need to go right here. And I called my netbird dot open source is awesome dot com. 
That's the only thing I need to change right there. Because once it gets that set, it's going to go run that curl command. It's going to pull down their stuff. And then it's going to run this script to get everything set up for us. We just need to provide them the fully qualified domain name right there that we're setting up for this server. So we're going to let this thing run. It's going to go pull some stuff down. You'll kind of see it as it processes. Just be patient while it gets running. And it'll be up and running in just a minute or so. All right, once everything runs through, it's going to tell you, hey, you can access your dashboard here. And then it's going to give you the uh, username of admin at your particular domain. And then it's going to give you a nice, long, strong password that you should copy immediately to keep track of. So let's copy that. Now, this is going to be gone. This is just a test system, so don't worry that you guys can see it. But we'll click here. This should open up in our browser for us. There we go. If you control click, it'll open up in your browser in this case. And the first thing it wants us to do is authenticate. So we're going to do admin at, and there's that one. That's good. We'll do that this is from when I tested before. I'm going to paste in the correct password. I'm going to tell it, sure. Now it's going to want you to set up two factor authentication. If you have devices for doing some kind of FIDO2 or WebAuthn stuff, you can do that. Um, I've not had a lot of luck with that with my iPhone, so I'm just going to use the normal authenticator with the TOTP token and you click on it and click next and when you have the dark reader on sometimes you can't scan this correctly so I'm going to have to switch this for just a minute so I apologize for the brightness if it comes up and once you get that code on your device whatever you're using for two-factor you want to type that in and hit next it's going to tell you that it's verified. You can hit next and it wants you to change the password. So we're going to paste in that password we copied earlier and we're going to change this to a new password that we want. And then we'll hit next. Everything is up to date. We're just going to hit next one last time and then put in our authentication code one more time. And there we go. We're up and running on NetBird's server and we used our Zitzel login. So that's really great. And you can see here that it's saying, hey, there's no devices. It can't find anything right now. So you can just close that little warning for now because we don't have any devices enrolled yet. But it wants us to get started enrolling a device. So you would just click here. And it's going to tell you, here's how you do this. So if you've got a Linux machine, here's what you would use. If you've got a Windows machine, you would download the installer for their, for their agent. Same way with Mac OS. Uh, Android, you go to the Google Play Store, get their app, and then here's some information and Docker. If you want to run this in a Docker container alongside your other containers, you can run it like that. Now remember, iOS is currently in beta, so it should be coming along soon, but it's not here yet, but soon you'll have an iOS tab up here as well. So I've got mostly Linux systems, so we're going to get into the installation and setup of a couple of Linux systems right now. All right, to install this on one of your Linux machines as a agent client, um, you want to follow their instructions. And they've got this nice one-liner. This is the one that I would try on most machines just to make sure that, it, you know, if it'll work, it makes it a lot easier. But if you need to do a manual install, you can try these steps here. You need to install things on Ubuntu. You can install it in different places. Uh, I'm just going to copy this, and we'll go to, I've got the command line up for this machine that I'm on. We'll paste it in here. And it wants my password as a super user, so I'm going to put that in. It's going to add a few things to Ubuntu here. And in this case, I'm running on 2310 with KDE. So it looks like this is going to have a similar command structure to um, Tailscale, where it's got a command line interface. It, it's fine uh, for the NetBird folks. I'm begging. People who are making things that are intended for Linux users to connect to a network. A GUI is an important thing in this day and age, even on Linux. So for instance, Tailscale does not make a does not make one, but Trayscale is this one that I'm using here for Tailscale. So I'm going to show you what it looks like here. And you can see I've got this list of all of the machines and devices that I have on my network. And if I click on one of them, I can see the details for it. It brings them up over here on the right side. I can do a few actions from here as well. And the top machine listed is the machine that I'm currently on, so I can see some information about it. So I've got all of this really great stuff that I can see about the different machines and servers that I have on my network. It's really useful. I love a GUI. It's really great. It's okay to have the command line, but 
Linux users are getting to the point where GUIs are just as important to us as they are to the rest of the world. So please, for the NetBird folks, for everybody else out there that's making any kind of VPN software, you need to have a GUI. Uh, even for Linux or Unix, yes, we like command line, but not everybody's like that anymore. They get into this software. You should be able to do everything from a graphical user interface as well as from the command line. So please consider that. So we've gotten into our actual user interface here, and what happens is this creates your NetBird account, but it also creates a Zitadel account. So there's a users section over here, but it doesn't actually let you use these users um, or create users from here. You actually need to do that from the Zitadel uh, UI. So if we just take this and copy it and then bring it to another tab, and we actually need to change this to be dot com and then it's slash ui slash console this is going to take us over to our zitadel management console and there's more to be set up on that as you would expect because it is a full-on single sign-on solution kind of like authentic or Athelia or some of those so there's there's a bit of stuff to be set up so you can see here it has three of six complete so the script that we ran to install the server actually set a lot of three of these things up and these other three are the things that we can go set up so you can do set up your brand you can go and uh, grant users and and then your smtp settings are important so this one if you want to add more users you're going to need to set this up because then it emails that user to say hey you know you've been set up with an account you need to go and actually verify that account so just be aware of that. I'm, I'm not doing a Zitadel video. I just wanted you to understand like, hey, if you want to add users, you need to kind of go this route where you add that. You go to your URL slash UI slash console, and that'll bring you to your Zitadel install. And then you can add users from there. Um, and then they can authenticate back to your NetBird install. Okay, that said, the, the fun part that we want to get to is actually adding a client. So a couple of things that you should be aware of. So I'm using Cloudflare. If you're using Cloudflare, you need to know this. So let me go back into Cloudflare and show you this because when I initially got here and I tried to set up a tried to set up an actual um, device, I was getting some errors and I couldn't figure out what was going on. So I emailed the guys over at NetBird and they were super helpful. They helped me work through it. They got me to send them some logs and things like that after I told them what was going on. So one of the things that they told me that I guess I didn't either. I don't think it was there. I looked, but in in their system they use grpc for some communication protocols and you need to make sure that that's enabled so you'd go to your cloudflare url or, or setup you'd go down here to network and there's these different options here under network and one of these options is grpc so you just need to kind of scroll down through here and you're looking for the grpc option uh, let's see right here under network and you'll see this is now enabled it was disabled when I first started trying to do this so the first thing is go make sure you enable this if you're using Cloudflare or if you use another host that's similar to Cloudflare you might need to make sure that gRPC is enabled once I did that um, the other part that I had uh, set up incorrectly here in the server that we set up earlier um, I needed to go into uh, so I had to do sudo nano slash etz slash hosts and I'll authenticate real quick. And in here, um, this loop, this local host and, and also a loopback address were both set up and they had uh, netbird.opensourceawesome.com and then netbird um, set up as well. So I just had to get rid of those things. So it just says local host right here. Um, once you remove those other entries, then you should be good. But if you have those entries here where local host or the loopback address is pointing to your domain name, it's going to create problems whenever your your um, systems try to authenticate whenever your different um, clients try to authenticate so two things you want to make sure to do is one make sure grpc is on if you're using cloudflare if you're not using cloudflare you probably don't need to worry about that one two go into your host file on your server and make sure that the fully qualified domain name is not being pointed at by localhost which is 127.0.0.1 or by loopback, which is 127.0.1.1. Once you've done that, uh, you should be ready to go and actually set up one of your clients. So I've already run the installer for the client. Um, it's just a one-liner, again, super easy, but we'll do it on another machine here in just a minute, but I'll show you what it takes to get installed. So I'm gonna zoom this up a little bit. When you go here and you say, hey, I'm gonna create a new one, it gives you the command. So this is the command that we run to install the client on Linux. 
and then down here it tells you here's how you do this but you can just copy this and then we can go back and we can just paste that in there and it's going to come up and you see it opens up the browser tab and it says hey do you want to go ahead and authenticate yes I do and this is the one that I want to use and it's going to say hey you did it good job so then over here it's going to tell us everything should be good so now we can do netbird dash dash help so if you want to see all the options you have for netbird um, here they are so you've got uh, you can do command line completion so you can set that up you can use uh, netbird down netbird help netbird login netbird service netbird self netbird status netbird up and netbird version so you can see all of those things and then you've got some different flags depending on what you're trying to accomplish and it tells you what these different flags do so the one we want to use is status which is status of the netbird service so we'll do netbird status and you can see here i've got uh, what the version is the cli version we've got the management is connected we've got the signal connected and then we've got this is my the name of my machine so this is kind of like my host name for this machine that i could actually get to um, we've got 100.96.75.133/16 and then here's the interface type which is through the wireguard kernel which is great and then the peers count is zero zero because I haven't set up any other peers yet. So we, we, we know that there's no other peers here. I went and set up the other machine and you can see it here on my Netbird site. So you can see that they're both listed and they both have their own domain names. Now, if I open up my terminal again, let's set up a new tab here. And I'll make the font a bit bigger. So you'll notice don't have the SSH server turned on for either one of these, but I'm going to be able to SSH because I have the SSH server running on those systems anyways. So I don't know that this is going to do anything in this case for my machines, but we'll give it a shot here. Let's just see. Um, first by IP address, let's do this one. I think if I just click it, it copies it. Yeah. So if we do SSH Brian at, and then I can paste in that IP address and we can just and we're in so I'm already on that machine you can see it's there and if I do netbird status from it you can see that it's connected you can see what its IP address is which is the one we just connected to and then it shows one of one peers is connected so as you add more peers you'll see that there's you know however many and then however many aren't connected and it'll give you that information so it's pretty nice in the CLI but again a GUI is really nice so we've got that working that's great this is Netbird. I think it's a really great system. I've really enjoyed using it. And as you can tell, there is some really great options here. I'd love to see you guys get out there and just take them up on this Teams option, $5 per user per month, even if it's just for yourself. This just lets them know like, hey, I appreciate what you're doing and I'd love to see you continue this and keep it going. And really for anything that you've got that's open source out there, guys, that you're using, if you have the opportunity, if you have the ability to go support them monetarily, please consider doing that because it does keep those projects going, those projects that you love to use, and it makes everybody else have a good experience with those projects as well, and it makes it so those projects can continue to do amazing work. I hope you enjoyed this. If you did, like, subscribe, tell your friends about it so they can come along the journey with us, and I'll talk to you next time. It's your open source advocate and I'm back and I've set up a store with a little bit of merchandise. I love being your open source advocate, but I want you guys to be the open source advocates with me. So if you want to get out there and get some of this stuff. And if you do, let me know what you think of it. Thank you for subscribing.